and and the the presentations will be will be available will be posted on the on the dedicated Elsa website. Um, I see here. I see here a question, so I can actually say that this has been replied to. There is another question. Uh, what would be an acceptable approach to pro to prove compliance with CSADR PSN B085 runway strength? Would it involve the ACR PCR? Now, maybe you remember that in the NPA, we are actually removing everything that is related to the ACR PCR from the CSs. So, so we just move them into, into the uh, uh, AMC part. And then there is another question on this topic. Is it reasonable to assume that ACR PCR changes to the regulation 139 will be introduced at the same time as the changes to the ADR OPS B090? So this is our higher code letter uh, operation um, requirement. Um, yes, indeed, this, this is correct because it's it's the same package. So the, the changes that were proposed to the OPS P090, but also to this higher code letter operation, they are from the same package. So so they will be um, they they will be adopted together. Yes. Please, if you have any other questions um, on on this uh, part on the on the ASA um, transposition of the of the ACR PCR, please. Please let me know. We still have time because we are we are a bit ahead. So as I said, if you have any questions, please pose them. If okay, maybe you don't have the question now. However, if it comes in uh, into your mind and it's on this topic, just post it and, and I will try to to reply to it. Thank you. Um. I don't see any questions. Okay. So no questions on this particular agenda item. So Mikael, if you are ready, I would yes. suppose that we go straight to your part. Yeah. And then once you have finalized, we can take uh, more questions. So I will stop sharing and Mikhail, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simona, and good morning to everyone. Um, can you see my uh, my screen in full mode? We can see it, yes. Perfect. Um, so um, I will in my presentation try to answer the two first questions from uh, Simona, uh, Simona's slide. So why a new method and what are its, uh, its benefits? So um, some background to, to begin uh, this, um, this presentation. I will um, try to explain you uh, the link between uh, the development of rational methods and uh, the benefits in, in terms of uh, sustainable development. Um, as I will detail it later, the rational uh, approaches enables materials optimizations uh, and they are also a doorway to, uh, uh, to green pavement and uh, all uh, new uh, processes. Um, I will detail it just later. Then uh, I will uh, present you Quite shortly, the historical methods, which are uh, semi and empirical ones. Uh, so first, a short overview, and then uh, I will uh, focus on the limitations of uh, those methods. Uh, and then I will present you really shortly uh, the new rational methods. Um, so an overview of what is a rational method and the opportunities that are offered uh, by those new methods. Okay. Um, so today, airfield payment 
engineers have new challenges uh, to face. Uh, so first, the sustainable development is today of major concern uh, with the, the concept of uh, green airport that you can hear uh, everywhere. Um, and this in the, in the context of aging payments. So some decades ago, the, um, the payment engineers uh, had to design new pavements. Uh, today, um, the work is about uh, performing payment testing uh, accu so accurate and uh, regular than possible uh, in order to uh, um, uh, to um, to rehabilitate rehabilitate payments or design overlays uh, and um, the asset management as a central part uh, on the um, today uh, last part of background uh, we have new generations of aircraft uh, with higher single reload, with higher contact pressures, and with complex landing gears geometries. So there are several ways, more or less direct, uh, for raw material savings and carbon impact reduction. The first one is materials optimizations, uh, thanks to advanced design methods that we called the rational methods, uh, combined with a, a full evaluation process. You have other ways, so the recycling and reuse, the low carbon materials or processes, or the an enhanced durability, because in, in there, indirectly, if you have uh, enhanced durability, you'll have uh, higher um, pavement life expect expectancy and uh it's uh the result is the same um those um, um those solutions are facilitated as i will demonstrate it just later by the uh rational methods so we have opportunities to, for that so the first one are the compu computational power uh, evolution. So we um, this uh, enables us to um, to develop those rational methods. So we are uh, going from the semi-empirical design method to rational mechanistic ones, which facilitates material performance approach, new materials emergence, uh, and also the possibility to develop uh, predictive models. The other part is we have today the, the capability to storage and process big data and this is a very important thing in the in the frame of the development of asset management uh, methods then you have uh, an electronic uh, technological revolution so sensors for in situ payment monitoring or instrumented test facilities this facilitates numerical methods in situ validation and especially rational methods calibration. So I start with the historical methods, which uh, are semi-empirical ones, as I have already said. They, uh, they have been developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers in the uh, between the 40s and the 70s. Uh, they are based on accelerated payment testing um initially using single and dual wheels it was later uh, extended to four wheels bogies and adapted uh, recently uh, during um uh, the the 2000s uh, uh, around the, uh yeah 20, 20 years ago through an artificial coefficient which is called the alpha factor those methods have several uh, neglect, uh, there are several effects neglected, like the temperature effect, the interface behavior, and they include uh, then huge safety coefficients. So uh, this method of simplified method, uh, we use abacus, uh, and there and also the concept of equivalent thickness. So for those who don't know the 
um, those historical methods, you have a coefficient for all materials, and um, which means that those thickness of this material uh, equals roughly uh, those uh, thickness of another material. So it's an, uh, an approximate method. Um, so th those methods have, be, have, be, have been used for uh, more than uh, 50, 50 years, but they have uh, shown their uh, limitations. Um, so the first, there is no explicit consideration of material damage. Then the subgrade bearing capacity for flexible payment is characterized by the CBR test, which is not uh, really representative of the real bearing capacity of the um, as a comp uh, when it's compared to plate test, for instance. Um, then the new materials are not correctly considered. There is no modeling of interface conditions between layers. This is um, an important thing uh, because uh, those parameters, the interface condition, um, is uh, really important when you um, um, in in most cases, when you have uh, issues on a payment, it comes from an interface condition problem. Uh, there is no consideration of the temperature and speed. Uh, for the speed, it's uh, you have macro coefficients uh, which um, um, mix speed, lateral wonder, etc., as a function of the um, movement area considered. An apron, a taxiway, or a runway, but it's uh, it's not uh, uh, satisfactory. It's not appropriate, finally, for new landing landing gear configurations. That's why we developed new rational methods. So, what's a rational method? So, these are methods which combine first. A mechanical modeling, which can be uh, an, an analytic model or finite element models, uh, to determine the stresses and strains in the pavement due to both the traffic or temperature effect. Uh, temperature effect is very important for rigid pavement, for instance. Um, so it combines this modeling with a performance approach, what we call performance approach. It's uh, a material characterization uh, through laboratory tests. So fatigue tests, um, stiffness tests, etc. So here you have an example of a, a fatigue uh, device um, from the CIRIMA, French, uh, uh, from the French CIRIMA. Um, then it has to be, um, and it, it's important to those methods have to be calibrated uh, through in-situ tests. So uh, here you have an um, example of, uh, of in-situ calibration with uh, here the PEP simulator. Uh, I will come back later on the calibration of the French, um, French methods. Um, so the recommended uh, approach for the development of those methods are um, combined, as, as I've already said, the, the modeling, a laboratory char characterization, and uh, an in-situ uh, validation. So on test facilities, on accelerated payment tests, or uh, using in-service -ser in payment testing. So well, today, um, um, today we are um, uh, we have um, we have a, sorry a full toolkit of uh, rational method from the new design to the overlay design um, with the intermediate steps, which are the payment testing and the payment management. Um, so for the new design, it's a state practice. Uh, in general, the, um, uh, the methods for flexible payment are um, multi-layer elastic analysis, 
uh, and for rigid payments, finite elements. Uh, for the payment testing, again, it's a state, state practice. The reference device is the heavyweight deflectometer, and it uh, combines mechanistic modeling plus a process of back calculation. Uh, I, will, I will not enter into the detail on that, but uh, you have uh, um, um, several, uh, a lot of doc documentation on the HWD, and if you want, you have to uh, flick the, the st uh, stack guidance on the stack web website. Um, now, about the payment management and aircraft admissibilities, you have the ACR PCR, PCR method, uh, so you have a generic method developed by the AKO, uh, so uh, the, AP, uh, the APEG uh, uh, Airfield Payment Expert Group from the AKO. And you also have uh, state practices uh, to, to decline it. For, for instance, in France, you have a, state, a specific state practice about the rigid PCR. Uh, so, as uh, Simona uh, explained it, it will be mandatory from November 2024. And at this date, you, you will have no more ACN PCN. Uh, so, you need to, to prepare to it. Uh, and uh, you'll have a software to, uh, to calculate, of course, your PCR. Uh, for instance, you have the, the PCR uh, Alize module, which is a uh, um, a specific module, module from the uh, French um, software for uh, payment design, and this this modulus uh, this module will be free available, and the on the stack uh, uh, will be free available. Sorry. So um, the the last part, the last uh, thing will be the overlay design. So uh, state practice again, and it will be the same method that used for the new payment design but it will be require a previous uh, step um, which will consist of testing the um, the existing payment and characterize it and uh, this is the the part on which you will have to to prepare um, so have a good uh, uh, a good knowledge of your payments uh, for AC for PCR calculation or uh, overlay design. Um, so the new rational design method benefits are a more accurate design, so which allows uh, material optimizations, and then um, they are adaptive methods. So uh, they are applicable to all input parameters, landing gear geometries, geometries, sorry, speeds, lateral wonder. Uh, temperatures and then uh, it uh, uh, it will enable implementing all materials provided they are characterized through laboratory tests and this will facilitate the promotion of recycling and reuse the use of local alternative materials too etc uh, just two examples of software so you have uh, for the new design um the Alize airfield software on the um on the left which is the, the french uh, software and on the right the farfield uh which is the uh, the us software um for both of them you have the same theory so multi-layered elastic model of burmester uh, but you have different fatigue laws french laws uh, for the for the first one, uh, or um, American one for the other one. Uh, those methods have been calibrated uh, from NA NAPTF uh, construction cycle for the US method. And for the French one, um, it was calibrated for low traffic um, from road calibration and for high loads uh, from two uh, Airbus-funded research program, which have involved the stack, the CIRIMA, and the University Gustave Eiffel II, uh, which are the PEP, the Pavement Experimental Program, and the HTPT, the High Tire Pressure Test. Um, so, 
the rational method or evolutionary method. So about continuous improvement on it, about the calibration coefficients, about, about the um, asphalt concrete fatigue loads, about the uh, input parameters like the reference temperature, the lateral wandering, um, and possibly at long term, at long term, uh, introduce viscoelastic models, uh, take into account non-uniform uh, pressure distribution, etc. So, as a conclusion, there are several advantages to rational methods. So, they uh, enable more accurate designs and so material optimization and enhanced asset management policies. Uh, they, they have a high adaptability to input parameters and open, uh, they are open to all new materials and they are evolution, evolution, evolutionary uh, methods. And um, we we have today uh, a current set of a consistent set, sorry, of rational methods. So for all steps of the airfield payment life, from the new design to overlay design, uh, and uh, between those uh, uh, between them, the asset management and testing, and um, all those rational methods have be, have been made uh, compatible with each other. Thank you for your attention and uh, uh, do not hesitate if you have questions to, to uh, ask them on the slide. Mikhail, thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation and thank you for giving us an, an insight of uh, what were the shortages and the drawbacks of the ACM PCN method and what are the benefits of the ACR PCR method? Um, indeed, please uh, please uh, please post your questions on the Slido and uh, please do that on the Slido and not on the chat because we are not monitoring the chat. We are actually monitoring the Slido. So uh, if you are if you are submitting your question to the chat, then we we will just uh, not not see it there. Uh, for the time being, I see some questions here. Um, I will try to quickly share the screen. Okay. Um, now, this one regarding the dedicated software. Um, Probably not. Probably we will not uh, publish this. Um, also, please take into account that we we have a difference between us and the FAA. So the FAA is a is a competent authority for aerodromes, whereas EASA, in this case, in in the current regulatory framework, is is not. So in in this particular. Um, subject we, we will not publish a dedicated software there are some questions which are i think more re relevant for serial serial in in his part but let's go through the other ones uh will there be any hard requirements for testing laboratories or does airport operators set those for themselves according to the requirements in the regulation well i i think you probably know that well, somebody is telling me that the screen is grey. Let me start again, sorry. I will try to share again. Maybe one no. Okay, sorry for this. It's going to take me a while.
Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm facing here an issue with uh, with uh, sharing my screen. So I will go then just reading the questions. Maybe you can already see them also in the um, in, in the Sligo, in, in the actual WebEx. Um, there is a question. If there is no conversion method from the PCN to PCR, is it correct that aerodromes will have to resurvey their pavements in advance of 28th of November 2024? Um, I would say yes, but please, Mikael and Cyril, what is your view? Yeah. Um... Yes, yes and no. Uh, yes, the the idea is to you, you need you need to to know uh, um, to know your 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 payments. Uh, there there are a lot of things that you already have because uh, when you you published a PCN a technical PCN uh, the thickness layers etc. You, you already have that theoretically. Uh, and then what will be missing uh, will be uh, um the bearing capacity of uh, of the subgrade uh from uh, play tests to to have mod mod uh, models of the the subgrade you have um but in a, in a, in a first time you, you will be able to uh to use um relationships between your cbr on your your uh, your play uh, your models so um you you won't have to uh to do a whole survey of your payment but the the, um, the passage to to pcr will be very the the good opportunity to 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 really know your, your payment perfectly if it was not the case for the pcn um, okay thank thank you michael then we have another question is there any process of back calculating using the old PCN and ACN values? I think this was quite clear that there is no correlation, right? Yes. Okay. Then we have another interesting question. What consideration has been given in relation to the likely transition costs that are to be placed on the industry? if it is mandatory to convert to the PCN methodology in 2024. So what assistance is the ASA and the European Commission going to offer to the industry in this regard? So Mikhail and Cyril, how, how do you see the costs? Because we, we discussed this before. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can answer this, uh, this question, very interesting question. Uh, regarding the costs, um, the, the main cost will be about the pavement evaluation, but as Michael said, it was already the usual business for airport and in particular to uh, compute and publish the PCN at airport. Uh, what we have to understand, and this is what I will explain in my presentation, is that the initial invest for PCR uh, calculation and publication um, will be um, negligible, I would say, compared to the benefits, economical benefits that the ACR PCR will bring to the industry, and in particular for the airport, but not only because that will benefit also uh, for the user. So I mean, for uh, for the uh, airlines operators. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Mikhail. Would you like to add anything on? No, this was, it was complete. Thank you, thank you, Sorry. Okay, then we see another question. Yeah, will there be any hard requirements for testing laboratories? Well, we, we EASA in this case is not imposing any requirements on the testing laboratories, so we are not regulating such entities. But of course, somebody has to determine the PCR. And I think in most of the cases, and if I remember well from when I was at the airport, we were not calculating the PCN. We had somebody doing it for, for us, and that was a, a, an, an organization. Um, another interesting question, uh, when will be the PCR Alize module from stock available? Is the module free or do we need a prior Alize license? 
It's uh, a free model. Uh, it will be available theoretically uh, within uh, ten days. Uh, it's all, it's it's ready, but uh, we need to, to to put it online. So um, mid mid October, it uh, it will be available. Um, it will be a free module. Uh, but uh, we had uh, this question uh, two days ago in a, in a French seminar. Uh, just to to be um, to complete, it will be um, enable only the calculation of PCR PCR on not new design. So you won't uh, you won't need to to buy uh, an analysis license uh, dedicated to to new design. Uh, so it's uh, uh, you you will be able to use only the PCR part, which is free, but you won't be able to to, to do design with it. Okay, there is another question on the software. Uh, the software presented are either US or French. Um, is there any will to develop an EU software? Which one is more suitable for other EU countries? I, I think I will answer this question after my presentation, but so currently we speak about the French software and the US, so the Fairfield uh, version 2.0. Uh, there is other software which are dedicated to pavement design and um, without any modules to compute the PCR, we can directly compute a PCR with the pavement design. So, for instance, in Australia, we have APSDS with different separate filler model. And uh, so I know some other pavement uh, design software and regarding specific software for PCR calculation. So currently, uh, on my knowledge, there is only the future module of Alize. There is Fairfield, but, but I will explain why Fairfield cannot match with uh, every uh, countries. And um, I have also developed a universal software when I developed the methodology because I have to uh, perform a lot of trade-offs. So uh, software is able to um, analyze any pavement with any separate failure models and the other parameters uh, I will spoke about. But basically, you can compute a PCR with just a pavement design software. I will explain. I will explain with the uh, uh, with the procedures uh, which will be used to arrive at at a PCR. Okay, um, Cyril, there there is another question that popped up here. Is what do you mean by negligible cost regarding the the benefits? Yeah, I mean because uh, the cost for pavement evaluation that would be the the main cost uh, for. Um, publishing the, the PCR, except if the airport is aware of uh, its pavement structures. So in that case, that will not be necessary to uh, analyze and evaluate the pavement. And since this question and so another question I saw in, in the chat uh, regarding the, um, the, the difference between the PCN with regard to the ACN and the PCR with regard to the ACR. Uh, basically, uh, we recognize that the early method, pavement design method, was over conservatives. Therefore, when we will analyze the pavement with a new methodology to uh, compute the PCR, um, in most cases, uh, the allowance, the aircraft allowance in terms of uh, weight admissibility, uh, will be uh, less conservative than the AC and PCN system. So, uh, the first step for PCR calculation, but this is what I will explain, is the calculation of the cumulative damage factors. And to compute this CDF, it is necessary to know the pavement structures. And the airport will see that the CDF is probably less conservative than the expected life uh, they had with the early method, pavement design method. So this is, that, this is one of the topic of, of my presentation. Okay. Um... And also, there are some interesting questions, but I think probably more relevant to your um, to, to your slots, Cyril, which are related to the PCR and how they have to take into consideration uh, seasonal temperature changes, but also geological considerations. So I think if, if you agree, let's take them after your presentation. And let me just scroll to to this. 
the latest one, okay. How is it expected that one monitors pavement overloading with ACR and PCR? Is this being covered with the presentation? Yes, so Cyril has also uh, some slides on overload. And then there is another question. Uh, it, it was related to the what happens if an airport cannot convert and cannot uh, have the PCR value ready for November 2024. So what can they do in this regard? How would the aircraft operator, how would that impact the aircraft operators? Uh, yes, it, it will be very difficult to work with both method ACN PCA and, and ACR PCR. So we cannot imagine uh, an aircraft um, taking off uh, with an ACN and landing with uh, an ACR. So that will be a nightmare uh, for the flight ops uh, department of the airlines to manage this kind of uh, of difference between two methodology. So. I, I would say that if an airport is not ready in November 2024, I will speak about the publication of the PCR with a code letter U, uh, which is uh, the non-technical evaluation, so based on the aircraft experience. But uh, this publication uh, should be only uh, for transitioning to a technical evaluation. Okay, and the technical evaluation could be made once uh, each time uh, a pavement um, is rehabilitated. Okay, but that will be only a transition, but uh, it is uh, obviously recommended to have a technical uh, publication for the, for the PCR just to have um, the maximum benefits of the ACR PCR and to, and to facilitate also the uh, airline's operation at airports. Okay, and uh, Cyril, I have a question in this regard. What are the drawbacks of uh, publishing a PCR with you? With what? Uh, I didn't with, with uniform, uh, having the the U in, instead of the T, the technical. Okay, um, I, I will explain. I will explain because this is directly this question is directly uh, related to the calculation of the cumulative damage factor i spoke about okay perfect so i think we we reply to most of your questions uh that were relevant um agenda item and as i said we left some of the questions to be answered by cyril after his uh, his presentation so, uh, Cyril, if you are ready, I think we can go on to your uh, your presentation. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. So, thank you, thank you, Simona. So, my name is uh, Cyril Fabre. Uh, so, following the re regulatory and technical background we had, thanks to Simona and uh, Michael, it's time to go in depth uh, with the ACR PCR protocol itself. So, but before, I would like to to remind because yesterday uh, I read the first discussion paper I wrote for uh, the IKO APEG uh, in uh, 2012, and I said that the promulgation of a new or improved method system must provide better performance and significant benefits to the industry in order to replace the current applicable system. And by the way, this um, during the development phase this, uh, has always been my common thread since the early stage of the ACR PCR development. And I think we, we uh, successfully achieved this objective. So it means that uh, the ACR-PCR is not only a question of compliance with regulation, but also a question of how the regulation, um, I would say, can support a better pavement management at airport for the benefits of all of the stakeholders involving in this uh, airport operation. So if you want a new system to perform better, um, we need to understand its fundamentals in order to be sure that its implementation will meet uh, the expected uh, added value. So it was my introduction, and so this is my uh, geography. So 
this presentation will be um, online. Therefore, it's just for the record. If you know uh, more about me and my background, you could uh, consult later. And I go directly to uh, the contents of my presentation. So the first part will be a summary of the key changes. And then um, I will speak about the main features of the ACR-PCR system uh, with first the CDF, which is a core principle of the ACR-PCR system, but also of the uh, rational method for pavement design. And I will, um, I will give you, uh, I think, three or four examples of PCR calculation, including one example dealing with the overload operations. And I will uh, finish my presentation with the benefits of the method and obviously the reference documents uh, to know uh, all details about the ACR, uh, PCR method. So this is uh, the time frame uh, that Simona uh, recalled earlier from the start of the ACR-PCR development until the full applicability in uh, November 2024. So to be more precise, this is uh, 88th of November 2024. So it means that uh, from now, uh, you have still two years remaining from now, so for implementing the new protocol. So this is um, challenging, but a good understanding of how it works and the key benefits that the new method will bring to every stakeholder will probably facilitate the transition from uh, the ACN uh, to the ACR-PCR uh, uh, system. So about the key changes, so for uh, first, what does not change? So for those who are familiar with the ACN-PCN system, the principle which consists in comparing two numbers remains unchanged. But the background for calculating both components of the system is fundamentally modified. So it relies no on rational models, allowing the calculation of pavement mechanical responses. So basically the pavement internal stresses and strains that are produced by surface traffic load from the layered elastic analysis. And um, these uh, mechanical responses are used to quantify uh, the pavement damage according to a given failure model that I will uh, speak about uh, later on. But for the ACR PCR system, uh, the subgrade failure model will be based on the subgrade criteria because we will see that. But the definition and uh, the meanings of the PCR is uh, the structural bearing capacity of the pavement to accommodate uh, traffic mix. So, therefore, this is a link to the structure of the pavement. And this is the reason why the criteria for ACR PCR system is a subgrade failure model and not. Uh, not uh, the other uh, criteria, which is at the base of the, the base course uh, material. So um, practically, uh, it means that uh, the new system will lead to new ACR values, which will be uh, calculated and published by the aircraft manufacturers. Uh, so the ACR uh, will be uh, based on the combined result of the aircraft we load, so the aircraft max takeoff weight, and then the aircraft we load tire pressure and landing gear geometry, so the, the type of uh, landing gear. And uh, unlike the uh, ACN PCN system, uh, for which only the reporting format were described, we have developed uh, recommended procedures for PCR determination um, with enough flexibility to comply with any national or local design practices and specificities, provided it uses the CDF concepts that I'm going to uh, detail in the uh, next slide. So uh, the CDF, so um, as I said before, addressing the ACR and the PCR, uh, I think uh, it is of paramount importance to understand what is a CDF, I spoke about a few minutes, since this concept is a core principle of the ACR, PCR, and in particular for pavement evaluation, which is required uh, to compute uh, a PCR. So, uh, what is the difference between the pavement uh, 
design and the pavement evaluation. So in a few words, the pavement evaluation is a process of defining the bearing capacity of the pavement for the measurement and studies of the uh, mechanical characteristics of the pavement and its behavior and the roads. And this is usually done by an inversion uh, process of the design using design parameters and method, but reversing the process to determine allowable loads from existing pavement characteristics. So this is the purpose of the CDF calculation. In other words, for pavement design, we adjust the pavement layers and materials to arrive at a CDF of one. And for pavement evaluation, we compute a CDF of an existing pavement with regard to the analyzed traffic that the pavement is, is supposed to uh, to accommodate. So by definition, uh, the CDF uh, is the amount of the structural fatigue life of the pavement, which has been used up and it is expressed as a ratio of applied load repetition to the allowable load repetition to failure. And for one airplane uh, and constant annual departure, it is expressed with uh, the formula uh, the applied coverage is to the coverage to failure. So when uh, it means that when the CDF is equal to one, it means that the pavement subgrade will have used all of its fatigue life. So this is a case for pavement design. The CDF equal to one is a target CDF when we design the pavements. If the analyzed CDF on an actual pavement is uh, lower than or equal to one, it means that the pavement subgrade will have some remaining life and the value of the CDF will give the fraction of the life use. For instance, if you have a CDF equal to uh, 0.6, it means that you have used up 60% of your uh, pavement potential and you have 40% remaining until the theoretical failure of the pavement. And adversely, if the CDF is greater than one, uh, it means that your pavement is theoret theoretically uh, failed. So this is for one aircraft. We compute the aircraft for each aircraft. And for a traffic mix, uh, we combine uh, the CDF with the minerals rolls, uh, which consists of adding every uh, CDF of the aircraft composing uh, a mix. So for uh, calculating the CDF uh, produced by one aircraft, we need first to define a calculation grid on which the stresses and strains are calculated for the bearing stairs mathematical, mathematical model, sorry. And this is an example of grids uh, which are generated for uh, either a simple gear configuration and for a more complex aircraft melanin gear arrangement. So as you can see, a simple gear configuration, we have a symmetrical axis because there is no interaction between the two gears uh, because of the distance between uh, each other. And for a more complex melanin gear geometry, so on the right, so this is an example with an F380, uh, we have a larger grid because uh, some interaction can exist between uh, the wing landing gear and the body landing gear of the aircraft. So this is an example. Um, of the grid, which can be generated to compute uh, the CDF. So, uh, based on this calculation, we can build uh, any longitudinal trend profiles in the defined calculation grid surrounded the studied uh, landing gear. So, in this example, I consider the vertical strain on the top uh, of the bread. Therefore, we uh, will obtain, in this case, uh, the subgrade CDF, as we could obtain also the CDF at the bottom of the base layers if we consider the uh, horizontal strains calculated at the base of the uh, lower layer of bitum bituminous material. So, following the different uh, profiles you can see on the bottom of the slides, uh, the lowest. Uh, maximum vertical strain is located uh, at three meters from the pavement symmetrical axis of the um, this is, this is quite normal because uh, the aircraft is far uh, far away from uh, from the sensor if we imagine that we have a sensor at this location and the highest maximum vertical strain profile is located at uh, 5.2 meters from the pavement symmetrical axis 
So uh, on the top uh, left, you have the expression, the most common expression of the uh, separate uh, elementary uh, damage. And uh, this is called the volar form of the elementary damage. So this is not the, the form uh, that is displayed in Fairfield because since uh, version 1.2 of Fairfield, the FA has developed a new subgrade failure model with a form which is called the Blisdale models. So if we want to uh, design new pavement with Fairfield, you will have a different subgrade failure model. And uh, at the at the bottom uh, at the top right, sorry, you have the continuous damage model, uh, which is used to compute uh, at each calculation point uh, the CDF uh, curve. So uh, you can see on the right. Uh, sorry, no, this is not one. Yeah, so um, when you have all longitudinal profiles, so along the Y axis, um, yes, this is right. Um, you can you can compute um, you can compute every uh, point for each uh, longitudinal profiles, which will be used to uh, build the CDF curve. And uh, then you, when you integrate uh, with the continuous from uh, two uh, along the, the y axis for uh, each longitudinal profiles, uh, you compute the damage produced by uh, one, one aircraft. Okay, so this is a CDF for n passes of one aircraft for a traffic mix. I propose to show an example where I added step-by-step the CDF of each aircraft composing uh, a mix. So this is the uh, input data that are required for computing the CDF, and that will be also uh, the inputs needed for PCR, as we will see later. But the CDF is the first step of the PCR procedures. So the pavement must be described for each layers from the subgrade to the surface with uh, and for each layer, so with a um, modulus of elasticity, so which is uh, commonly known as the U modulus, and the Poisson's ratio, and obviously the thickness for each layers. And for the uh, traffic to simplify, each aircraft is assigned with its total number of passes, but many other parameters are also involved, such as standard deviation following the uh, studied uh, maneuvering area, the aircraft speed and the average temperature to adjust the effective uh, asphalt concrete uh, immodulus. Uh, but people who are familiar with pavement design are supposed to uh, know that. And for the other, it doesn't matter, just retain all the total uh, CDF of a traffic mix uh, is gradually uh, built. So this is, uh, according to this input data, this is the CDF curve when we had the first aircraft in the list. So the red uh, dot line identifies vertically the critical offset, which is the location of the maximum CDF, and horizontally the values of the max CDF. So Regarding the critical offset, in, it can be also defined as the location of the max strength and stresses concentration when the aircraft mix are combined each together. And the contribution of each aircraft to the max CDF is seen as a critical offset and should not be confused by, uh, the, with the max CDF of each indiv individual aircraft. So you will see that an aircraft can have a relatively high CDF with a poor contribution to the max CDF produced by the entire mix. So at this stage, we have only one aircraft, the F330-900, and its contribution to the max CDF is about 100%. Uh, so this is normal because this is the only aircraft uh, in, the, in the traffic. So now we had the second airplane, the critical offset is not modified uh, between, uh, no, because both aircraft have the same uh, landing air track, but the CDF max increases at the contribution to the max CDF is about 72% for the F330 and 28% for the F350. So it doesn't mean that the F330-900 is more aggressive compared to the F350 because both aircrafts 
um, have not the same annual departure at the beginning. So this is normal. If we uh, uh, if we want to compare the uh, relative uh, aggressiveness of each aircraft between each together, uh, in, we have to do that uh, with an equal number of uh, annual departure. So now um, I, I, I have the, the next aircraft. So this is a 747. So I have to, to move my window because I have not full. Okay. So uh, the critical offset is still unchanged, but the CDF max is increases with the addition of the uh, 747. So now the fourth aircraft, the uh, triple seven three hundred uh, extended range. So you can see that each time I add an aircraft, uh, the contribution to the max CDF of each aircraft is is changing, and uh, the critical offset also can change when we had uh, an aircraft with a relatively high contribution to the to the max CDF. With a different uh, gear geometry, and obviously the CDF max is also uh, increasing. So another aircraft, the 737 Max 9. So this aircraft is very uh, interesting because uh, its max individual uh, CDF is pretty high, but its contribution to the max CDF is 1%. So this is just because uh, the contribution to the max CDF is observed at the critical offset location. And because of the 737 gear geometry, which is quite narrow, uh, this aircraft has a very poor contribution to the max CDF. But when it is um, considered individually, it has uh, a, a quite high uh, max CDF. So this is the reason why I said don't, uh, don't confuse the contribution of the max CDF for each aircraft with the max CDF of each individual aircraft. So next aircraft is the F380-900, so 5% for the contribution. We increase again the CDF max. And then I had the F320-NEO, so the critical offset has moved uh, to, the, to the left, and we again increase the CDF max. And this is uh, the last aircraft. So if we remember the slide just before, the critical offset was located at 5.1 meter from the pavement center line. And when I added the F-21 new aircraft, uh, so it was assigned with a very high number of annual departure. So it has a very uh, significant influence on the max CDF in terms of, of the numerical values but also because of its um, landing gear geometry, it has uh, an effect also on the location of the critical uh, offset. And when uh, you have all the aircraft in the mix, you have the total damage produced by uh, the aircraft mix and the repartition, so the contribution of each aircraft to the, to the max CDF. So I think it was uh, important to uh, explain this. Um, get the windows. Yeah, uh, to understand the, the CDF before um, before speaking about um, the ACR PCR method. So now I propose to uh, to continue with the with the ACR, and after we'll have a short break for a question uh, about the CDF and and the ACR. So regarding the definition, this is uh, some this is not something new, but this is exactly the same as for uh, the ACN. The only difference is uh, the letter R which replace the letter N. So the definition of the aircraft classification rating is the number expressing the relative effect of an aircraft on the pavement for a specified standard subgrade strength. So regarding the way of calculating the ACR, the principle is also very similar to the ACN and is numerically defined 
as twice of standard derived single wheel load, requiring the same pavement thickness as required by the aircraft for a standard subgrade strength. So practically, uh, it means that it involves three steps. So first, we design the pavement for the aircraft. Then we adjust a standard derived single wheel load to obtain the same pavement thickness as required by the aircraft. And the aircraft ACR is then twice this uh, derived single wheel load. Um, so, uh, by the way, the change versus the ACN are first, uh, the pavement is no designed according to a rational pavement design procedure. So, in comparison with the CBA design procedures for flexible pavement and the raster guard procedure for the rigid pavement. And this is a major change uh, comparing to the ACN and the key parts of the uh, ACR calculation. So other change is about uh, the standard tire pressure, which is now 1.5 megapascal instead of 1.25 megapascal for, uh, for the ACN. So we modified uh, the standard tire pressure to be more representative of the actual aircraft tire pressure but we made a lot of trade-off from one bar to two bars, and there is no uh, major difference for the ACR, ACR calculation uh, because of the concept of uh, the derived single reload. And important information is, uh, which is the third the change uh, in comparison with the ACN, is that the ACR is now expressed in hundreds of kilograms and no longer in thousands of kilograms which was the case for the ACN. So um, we, um, so at the APEC, we, we, we had a long discussion about that and we decided to express the uh, ACR in hundreds of kilograms, just uh, to avoid any confusion between an ACN and, uh, between ACN and ACR and then between PCN and PCR. So it means that uh, the, the ACR will be about the magnitude of a tenth if we compare with the, uh, with the uh, ACM, but uh, approximately 10 because there is no uh, conversion between ACM and, uh, and, and, and ACR. So it's not recommended, obviously, to uh, compute an ACR by multiplying the ACM by a factor of 10. This is uh, irrelevant. So, uh, regarding the subgrade uh, strength categories, uh, so as for the ACN, the ACR is computed for, for some standard subgrade strength categories, uh, ranging from the category uh, A to uh, ultra low uh, categories, so for the category D. So, the good news is that the subgrade strength is now characterized by its elastic modulus for both flexible and rigid pavements. Uh, so that means that we have no unified subgrade strength categorization for both uh, pavement uh, types. So regarding, uh, because I'm sure I, I will have this question, uh, regarding the uh, E-modulus, it may be obtained by the following means. For, for uh, new runway construction, uh, usually uh, we use uh, in-situ tests, so basically the plate uh, load test or laboratory test or combination of both. And for actual uh, existing pavements uh, in the uh, IKO Aerodrome Design Manual Part 3, so the new release uh, July 2022, uh, we mentioned some approximate conversion between the CBR or the K value with the E modulus. And the formula can be reversed uh, to obtain the CBR from the E modulus or an E modulus uh, to, uh, to a CBR uh, value. So uh, the ACR procedures, and first for the flexible uh, ACR. So for flexible ACR, we had to define a reference structures for designing the pavement since the layered elastic analysis uh, does not return a single equivalent thickness for all of the pavement structures as for the early design method, such as the CBA design procedures, but a series of layers that are laid from, from the subgrade to the surface. And for this purpose, the aim was to select uh, reference pavement structures, which would make eligible the largest aircraft weight uh, range for, for the ACR calculation. So 
Um, at the end, after many trade-offs, we have selected two different structures for flexible pavements, which uh, differ only on the top layers with a thickness of three inches of uh, HMA P401 uh, pavement item for aircraft equipped with two wheels or less on the main landing gear, and five inches for aircraft equipped with more than two wheels on the main landing gear. So the design layers, uh, which is uh, the P209, uh, P209 material, uh, so this is crushed aggregate materials with a e modulus uh, as a function of the thickness. And the subgrade is considered as infinite and takes success, uh, successively the values of uh, the four uh, subgrade uh, standard strength categories. So then the uh, ACR are automatically uh, compute as follows. So first, with the reference structure, we designed the pavement for uh, 36,500 passes of the considered aircraft. And then we uh, determine the single isolated wheel load inflated as a standard air pressure inflation of 1.5 megapascal. That produces uh, the same damage, that is a CDF of one, on the pavement structures uh, for the same number of passes. Okay, so uh, it means that when we design the pavement, uh, we target, we adjust the design layers to arrive at a CDF of one. And then uh, we take this uh, design pavement structures for the considered aircraft, and we adjust the single wheel load inflated as a standard air pressure to arrive at a CDF of one. And then the ACR is equal to twice this uh, derived single wheel load reloads, uh, which is expressed in hundreds of uh, kilograms. So uh, now the ACR uh, procedures for rigid pavement. So as you may know, we have a different mechanical behavior and a different design criterion, which is for rigid pavement, the horizontal stress at the bottom of the slab. And as for the flexible pavement, we have defined a reference structures, which is composed of a 20 centimeter thick base course with a fixed E modulus. And the design layer in that case is a concrete slab surface with a fixed E modulus and a working stress equal to um, 2.75 megapascal. Then, based on these reference structures for the SCR calculation, consists in designing the slab thickness to reach the maximum working stress and determine the derived single wheel load, which produces the same working stress on the previously uh, designed slab thickness. So, this procedure is repeated for the four subgrade strength categories, and the SCR is again twice the derived single wheel load expressed in uh, hundreds of uh, tons. Uh, so before the break for questions, this is uh, the different uh, way of accessing to the ACR data. So basically the uh, aircraft manufacturer publish uh, the uh, aircraft models ACR in the document, which is called the Air ACAP, so the aircraft characteristic for airport planning or um, AC manual, aircraft characteristic manuals. So uh, in this document, we uh, provide the, the uh, aircraft ACR for the critical weight and the center of gravity uh, configuration. Usually, this is the maximum ramp weight and the CG, uh, which gives the higher wheel load on the main landing gear. And the ACR may be also provided for lower weight in order to have some interpolation to get an approximate ACR at any operating weight. But the uh, easiest way of, uh, of getting the ACR data is a dedicated software, which is the IKO ACR uh, software, which is very similar to the current IKO ACN, which is available uh, with the following features. So we have in the software an aircraft library, which is continuously updated. So currently we have all Airbus models, Boeing models, Embraer. We have also the Comac and many other manufacturers. Uh, 
In this software, we have also the possibility to define uh, and customize the aircraft configuration. So it is possible to build a new aircraft. And uh, the uh, software computes a flexible and rigid ACR for any uh, operating weight and any percentage of load on the main landing gear and also any tire pressure. So you can uh, fully customize the aircraft ACR, okay? And it can be uh, downloaded uh, by using the web link that I mentioned at the bottom of the slide. So it is hosted by the uh, FAA website, so the Airport Tech uh, website of the FAA. Uh, and it is uh, continuously updated with the aircraft library. And this is uh, the end regarding uh, the ACR. So if you have any question, Feel free to ask the question. There are some difficulties to Uh, Simona, I cannot read the, the question because I share my screen with my presentation. If you can read the question, if any. Yeah, okay, I will share again after. significant changes between computing the CDF number from runway taxiways, where the aircraft is moving, and aprons, where it is stationary, or will that be made in the same manner? Yeah, this is a very good question, and it depends on the software you use. So, if we use uh, Fairfield, for instance, there is a unique uh, lateral wandering input. So the, for the FAA, the lateral distortion is about 77 uh, meters, and this is valid for every uh, maneuvering area. So should it be an apron, a taxiway, or uh, a runway? Um, in Alize and in the future uh, PCR module of Alize, and uh, we consider a different lateral wandering according to the maneuvering area. So this is about zero for the apron, uh, 0.5 for the taxiway and 0.75 for the runway. And so, with my computer, you can adjust also the lateral wandering according to um, to the theoretical values or the observed lateral wandering at airports. So, because um, I had recently a discussion with Blagnac Airport, and he said that um, with the new aircraft model, which are very precise in terms of maneuverability, the lateral dispersion on the taxiway is lower than 0 0.5. So therefore, the observed routing on the runway is like a, a rail. So you know. So in that case, you can adjust the lateral wandering from 0 0.5 to 0 0.3 of or, or, or the value you want. But it depends on the conservatism uh, you want to to achieve. This is one of the parameters which will be customized for PCR calculation. Okay. Um, I have another question here. What are the input from aircraft manufacturer required to compute the CDF? Um, so the CDF, uh, the input for the CDF is the pavement structures. So the description with each layers, uh, E modulus, Poisson ratio, and thickness, and the, the analyzed traffic mix. Okay. Thank so you. This, this is exactly the same inputs uh, for pavement design, because for pavement design we compute the CDF and we target a CDF equal to one. So this is exactly the same inputs. And I see here a last one question on, on the CDF. What if your figure of your CDF is higher than one by November 2024? Yeah, 
that will be the PCR parts. I will show two examples, one uh, with a CDF lower than one and another one with a CDF greater than one. Okay, and now regarding the, the ACR, if uh, I just go to the search. So if ACR of aircraft are published by aircraft manufacturers, then why do we need further calculation of ACN by software like ICAO ACR? Yeah. Um, because uh, the aircraft manufacturers uh, publish the official ACR values, ACN previously values, uh, for each aircraft models at uh, the maximum ramp weight and at a lower weight to interpolate for an intermediate values. So if an airport um, have an aircraft with an ACR greater than the reported PCR, therefore by back calculation, it will be able to compute uh, what is the maximum aircraft allowable weight according to this uh, pavement PCR. So this is just to be more precise um, on the maximum aircraft allowable weight because the interpolation is just an approximate values uh, for every operating weight. But the curve of the ACR with regard to uh, the aircraft weight is not exactly linear. Okay, so with the software, you will have exactly uh, the exact values of the ACR for a given weight, center of gravity and tire pressure. Okay, and then we have another question. When will the aircraft manufacturers publish ACR data in their manuals? Uh, this is already done, at least for Airbus and Boeing, and I, 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 I put the pressure uh, to the other manufacturers to do it uh, as quickly as possible. Okay, there is another question. Is it correct that airline operators will need to wait for aircraft characteristics, airport and maintenance planning document revision? Um, airlines could use the aircraft ACR only when the airport will publish the PCR. Okay, and I think there's one last question, but I think you already answered to it. Are ACR values published by constructors? For the official values, but uh, the software I mentioned was developed by uh, the uh, FAA according to the exact procedure for the uh, ACR, so it is validated by the IKO also as the official uh, software to compute the ACR. Therefore, uh, the across manufacturer um, make their calculation according to the software. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, Cyril, Mikhail, there are many questions on the ACR, PCR, but I think from just going through them and scanning them, um, I see that they are mostly related to PCR calculations and also questions on the software and also on the still some questions on, uh, on the benefits. So uh, I think I would like to address these questions once you you finish with uh, with your presentation with uh, with the remaining topics that you have. Sigur. Is that fine for you? Yeah, but I have some difficulties to recover my full screen, so <laughs> I try to manage. I have the full screen on my uh, the screen for participants. I, I cannot recover my presentation on my screen. Uh, let me just maybe. Uh, ah, it's better. Yes. And now I can stop sharing and you can. Yeah, it's better.
Okay. It's okay? We can see it. Thank you, Sir. Okay. So I propose then to continue with uh, with a PCR. So this is the last part of this uh, O1S session that will be about the PCR with details on the reporting format as described in the Amendment 15 of the Annex uh, IPO Annex 14. And uh, I will explain also the, um, the PCR procedure step by step, and I will finish with some uh, example uh, and the new guidance for uh, overload operations. So uh, there is no change again for the definition uh, of the of the PCR compared to the PCN, uh, except the word unlimited uh, that has been replaced by unrestricted. So it was. Um, it was already replaced uh, in the Annex 14 uh, for our previous revision because uh, when referring uh, to unrestricted operations, it does not mean unlimited operations, but refers to the relationship of PCR to the aircraft ACR and the allowance of an aircraft to operate without weight restriction when the PCR is greater than or equal to uh, the ACR. So, uh, adversely, the term unlimited operations does not take into account pavement life. So, this is the reason why, uh, to avoid any confusion, we replace the word uh, unlimited by uh, unrestricted. So, uh, regarding the reporting formats, um, but before I would like to um, um, devise a little bit about the responsibility of defining uh, a pavement a PCR. Um, so who, who is responsible for uh, the calculation and the publication of the PCR? So this is first uh, the airport operators who publish the PCR data in the airport's AIP, but those data are usually uh, determined by airport consultants who are supposed to document in a PCR dossier the details detailed input data collection and the description of the method which has been used to arrive uh, at the PCRs. Should it be the IKO generic procedure, I will explain, or the applicable national or local uh, specificities. So this is a, a real job which requires uh, trained people with a strong civil engineering background. And as I said earlier, the ACR PCR should not be uh, implemented just uh, for the sake of IKO or EASA compliance, but also to support um, a better uh, airport pavement management and to, uh, I would say, evolve uh, from a curative to a more predictive approach. So, you know that um, aviation currently is uh, continuously growing with few possibilities to extend airport footprints, therefore, airfield pavements. Uh, must be treated as a treasure, and this is also your biggest asset. And aircraft boarding, taxi, takeoff, and landing operation would not be possible without safe, strong, and sustainable pavement. So, by the way, the ACR-PCR system, if it is accurately implemented at airport, will be, uh, is, and will be a very powerful tool for optimizing aircraft weight admissibility and maximizing airfield pavement use while reducing pavement maintenance cost and carbon footprints at the end. So that being said, let's start with the reporting format. So uh, you can see this is exactly uh, the same format uh, as for uh, the PCN. Um, so the PCR are uh, published in the Ironical Information Publication AIP according to this format. So just um, to specify, uh, when we modify the uh, Annex 14 with the Amendment 15, uh, we also modified a little bit the, um, the Annex 15 uh, for uh, reporting the, the PCR. Uh, so we just uh, propose to add PCR uh, in front of the publication to be sure that we are speaking about a PCR. Uh, even thought uh, with uh, 
is um, the ACR being now expressed in hundreds of kilograms, we can make the difference between uh, NACN uh, or ACR and PCN and, and PCR. So basically, the PCR is composed of one number, which is a PCN number, and four letters. So the first letters uh, is um, related to the type of pavement. So it can be either flexible or rigid pavement for composite, composite structures or special structures. Uh, it is necessary to, um, to identify the structures either in flexible or rigid pavement according to their mechanical, mechanical behavior. The second letter is the subgrade strength categories. And uh, the third letter is the maximum allowable tire pressure. So regarding the maximum values for the letters W, X, Y, and Z, there is no change compared to uh, the PCN reporting format. So I recall that uh, these values was already modified in uh, 2009 or 12. I don't remember. No, it was in 2009. Uh, it was the amendment 12 of the annex 14. Uh, previously, the code X was 1.5 megapascal and the code Y was one megapascal. So this is uh, the new values since uh, 2009. And the last letters is an information about the evaluation method. So the, the letter U, um, which stands for using aircraft experience, and the letter T for uh, the technical evaluation, which is uh, um, the prefer. Um, the prefers uh, method for uh, PCR determination and uh, publication. So um, I recall the four different uh, subgrade strength categories, A, B, C, D. So uh, for the ACR slide, it was the average values because each ACR is computed for the average values for each categories. But uh, for the PCR, uh, I mentioned the, the range of uh, E modulus according to each category. So for instance, for the category B, that will be all pavement with a subgrade uh, E modulus uh, between 100 megapascal and 150 megapascal. So it means that if your subgrade uh, modulus is 120 megapascal, the CDF will be computed uh, for uh, E modulus of 120 megapascal and not for the average values because the PCR uh, must represent the actual pavement characteristics. So, and you have the, not the correlation, but the uh, former uh, subgraph strong categories for uh, the flexible and rigid pavement. So, previously with the CBR uh, values for flexible pavement and uh, the K-modulus for the, for the rigid pavement. And at the bottom of this slide, you have the two uh, formula to convert uh, the CBR into an E-modulus or uh, the K-value into an E-modulus. So obviously uh, for pavement evaluation and PCR calculation, it will not be necessary to open your pavement and to perform a plate test that will be very costly and, uh, and, and useless at the end. So if you know your CBR or your K values, you can use this uh, conversion uh, equation to arrive at the subgrade uh, E modulus. So some other, um, other conversion uh, can exist. For instance, in France, uh, they produce some um, abac abacus to convert uh, CBR into E modulus and the K into E modulus. So in France, uh, they will probably use this conversion uh, formula. But uh, the one we have mentioned in the ADM is uh, those uh, on, the, on the screen. So regarding the tire pressure, I already uh, spoke about it. Uh, so uh, since we have modified those tire pressure limits some years ago, it is important to mention that the result of the recent pavement research and re-evaluation of the former test we did 
uh, at that time with um, high temperature tests uh, performed by Airbus and the French uh, CA, or the uh, other fire pressure tests um, performed at the uh, FA Technical Center in Atlant Atlantic City. So the new research uh, reaffirms that, except uh, of unusual pavement construction, uh, for instance, flexible pavement with a thin asphaltic concrete cover or weak uh, upper layers, the tire pressure effects are secondary to wheel load and wheel spacing. For rigid pavement, generally, uh, there is no need to uh, have a tire pressure uh, limitation, except if uh, you observe some cases of spalling joints or unusual surface defects, such as uh, longitudinal or corner cracks. And for flexible pavements uh, or rigid pavement with flexible overlays, it is usually ac acceptable to uh, establish a tire pressure limitation when experience with high tire pressure indicates uh, a pavement distress at the uh, pavement surface. So, uh, no, um, the PCR procedures as recommended by the IKO. So first for PCR calculation, um, it is needed first to evaluate your pavement as it was already the case for the PCN and the evaluation of the design method are not imposed by the IKO since many, many IKO member states have developed their own methods. So um, I would say it, it wouldn't make sense, for instance, to evaluate a pavement with a subgrade failure model, which does not match with the model which serves the de design phase. And the only mandatory requirement for PCR is to remain consistent with the overall parameters of the ACR-PCR protocol. So the good news is that contrary to the PCN for which the IKO provided only the reporting format and some explanation of the reporting formats, uh, we have now developed a recommended procedures for determining the PCR, which is compatible with any pavement design and analysis method. And secondly, the CDF concepts combined with the minerals roles becomes the core principle of the PCR procedures and it means that if you are uh, evaluating uh, pavements is uh, lower than or equal to one, I think it was one question I had for uh, the ACR. So it means that your pavement is well or over design. In that case, uh, the PCR procedures will produce, will not produce any weight restriction uh, for the aircraft uh, composing the mix. And adversely, if the pavement CDF is higher than one, that means that your pavement is under design. It means that at least one aircraft from the evaluated aircraft mix uh, will have a weight restriction. Okay, and the last point, very important point, as the PCR is related to the structural pavement life, the CDF for flexible pavement uh, should be based on the subgrade failure model. But for pavement design, which is another story, um, common and uh, usual uh, pavement engineers practices um, imposes also the verification of the uh, CDF at the bottom of uh, the base layers so of the asphalt of bituminous layers. So common practice verified what is the criteria which reach uh, the values of one first. So, uh, as already said, although the ACR calculation procedure is unique and cannot admit any deviation, the PCR procedures allows using any damage model as long as it remains consistent with the design parameters, in particular for the CDF calculation, which can vary according to uh, the following parameters. So, for first, the elementary uh, damage. Uh, which is a subgrade failure model in the case of, of the PCR. So I spoke about the subgrade failure model in Fairfield, which is different from the one in Alize or APSDS for uh, the Australian uh, software. We can differ also uh, for the consideration of the multi-axle loads, so the tandem wheels, 
So if we compare uh, Alize and Fairfield, no, this is exactly the same procedure. So previously, the FA computes the multi uh, axle loads with the longitudinal component of the past coverage ratio for those uh, who are uh, well uh, familiar with Fairfield, but it is no longer the case. So it can also differ uh, by the way of calculating the aircraft lateral wonder. So uh, we have two different methods and also the values of the standard deviation. So as I said, um, for Fairfield, uh, there is a unique uh, standard deviation values, but uh, with other software, we can adjust the standard deviation uh, following the considered maneuvering array. And uh, last uh, parameters which can have a significant influence on the PCR calculation, so on the CDF, but if we have a significant effect on the CDF, you will have a significant effect also on the PCR. So this is the aircraft speed or the frequency because uh, the speed is uh, converted into a frequency and the temperature adjustment uh, to arrive at the effective A modulus. Okay, so the aircraft speed usually it is recommended to apply a speed of 30 uh, km per hour on taxiways and 100 km per hour on runways. And this has an effect on the effective uh, E modulus. And same thing for the temperature because the E modulus. Uh, of an asphalt materials depends uh, significantly of the temperature and this um, variation as given by the material massacre. Um, so, uh, obviously, as I said, uh, it is necessary also to use uh, the same damage models uh, which was used at the early stage of the pavement design. design. By doing so, that will ensure the consistency between what the actual pavement is able to uh, withstand and the PCR uh, assignments. And the inconsistency uh, between the damage models used for pavement design and the one uh, for PCR determination could result either in PCR uh, underestimation which will uh, lead to an unoptimized use of pavement and potential denial of aircraft uh, operating weight, and then a loss of revenues for the airport. And for the other case, the PCR overestimation will lead to uh, an accelerated pavement deterioration, uh, and then a reduced pavement life and uh, an increased cost of uh, pavement uh, repair cost or to rehabilitate your pavement because you will accept more uh, aircraft um, annual departure or aircraft weight than uh, what your pavement is capable of accommodating. So the understanding and selection of the appropriate damage model and all associated model for the PCR calculation is very, very, very important. So uh, I will take some time for this slide because this is, uh, this is uh, the flowchart for the PCR uh, uh, assignment as described in the ADM part three. So the the, the, the two input data, which are the, the traffic data and the pavement data, I will not come back on that. I already uh, speak about it uh, earlier, but uh, I start with the first step of the procedure. So the first step consists uh, in uh, identifying the aircraft with the highest ACR at its operational weight in the traffic mix. And then so we will see later why uh, this first step. In fact, this is um, this is um, because we will uh, in the PCR procedures we have an iterative procedures, and this is a criteria to stop the, the iteration. Um, so the second step consists for the traffic mix and uh, evaluating pavement to calculate the maximum pavement damage. So this is a calculation of the CDF and uh, we record uh, the calculated uh, CDF. Then on the CDF curve, we select the aircrafts that contribute the most to the CDF max. 
So this is called the most demanding aircraft of or the most contributing aircraft. And then once you identify this most contributing aircraft, you remove all aircraft from the list and you keep only the most contributing aircraft. And you adjust its number of annual departure so that the pavement damage, so the CDF, is exactly the same as the CDF of the full traffic. So, for instance, if the CDF of uh, the mix was equal to 1.2, uh, when you have only the most contributing aircraft, so obviously its max CDF will be uh, significantly lower than the CDF for the entire mix, then you adjust by increasing its number of passes to arrive at the CDF produced by the entire mix. So I continue with this example. The CDF was equal to 1.2. Now, by adjusting the number of annual departure for the critical aircraft, this makes this aircraft equivalent to the full traffic, but it is not compliant with the pavement because in this example, the CDF was equal to 1.2. So a good pavement, well designed, uh, has a pavement CDF equal to one. So therefore, you adjust the aircraft weight to arrive at a CDF of one. Okay, and now this make uh, the aircraft, the equivalent aircraft, compatible with the pavement, and you compute the ACR uh, of the aircraft at its adjusted weight, and this is the PCR one. Hello. I am saying PCR1 because uh, this is a stopping uh, criteria. If the, most, the first most demanding aircraft is also the highest ACR aircraft, therefore the PCR of the pavement is equal to the PCR1. Otherwise, you remove the first most demanding aircraft from the list and you reintroduce all other aircraft in the list, which is called the reduced list because no, there is uh, one aircraft less, so the first one, and you redo exactly the same procedures until you meet uh, the aircraft with the highest ACR. And then if you are for uh, iteration, it means that you have obtained four different PCR values, and the pavement PCR is the maximum values between all values previously computed. Okay, so the purpose of this uh, iteration until we meet the max ACR aircraft uh, is to account for certain cases when we have a large number of annual departure of uh, short medium range aircraft such as uh, 737 and F320, for instance, and the relatively small numbers of departure of a long range aircraft. Uh, and without these steps, the smaller aircraft would generally be identified as critical, with the result that the PCR would require a reasonable operating weight restriction on larger aircraft, unreasonable because the design traffic already included the larger aircraft. And we can note that if the initial critical aircraft is also the aircraft in the list with the maximum ACR at, at uh, its operating weight, then the procedure is completed uh, in one iteration with no subsequent reduction to the uh, traffic list. So this is the official, um, the official um, procedures uh, to arrive uh, at a PCR. This, this is a generic procedure and it can be adapted, as I said, to any uh, method for uh, pavement evaluation and to any, um, any way of calculating the CDF. Uh, therefore, it is only mentioned the CDF, but it is important to uh, have a CDF calculated according to the uh, pavement design parameters to make the PCR calculation compliant uh, with uh, the pavement as it was uh, it was uh, designed. So I, I I think it is it is quite complex uh, when you uh, when you are hearing for the first time about the PCR procedures. Uh, I, I hope that will be. A little bit more clear with uh, with uh, 
example, except maybe Simona, if uh, we have uh, one or two questions before I, I show the example, I, I don't know. We do have questions and actually we said that we are going to reply to them to actually to those that have as many likes. So maybe you can you can already take this question. Uh, how often is it expected the airport operator to redo the complex PCR survey on their pavements? The frequency to review the PCR is, is a question. Yes, yeah, so, so how, how often is it expected the airport operator to redo the complex PCR survey of the, on, on their pavements? Good question. And I think the answer will be a good news. For a new pavement construction, if you, if you design your pavement for a period of 20 years, for instance, then you publish your PCR, which will be valid for 20 years. It will have to be reviewed only if there is a significant change in the reference traffic which served the PCR calculations. So significant change means that one aircraft which was identified in the reference traffic increased significantly its number of annual departure on a new aircraft model which uh, possesses very different uh, features such as uh, an heavier uh, max takeoff weight, for instance. But uh, the PCR um, basically should not be reviewed over uh, the theoretical pavement design life. And for existing pavements, um, so if you evaluate a pavement which was built, for instance, five years before for a period of 15 years, it's just an example. So it means that you will evaluate your pavement after five years of use, and you will publish the PCR for the remaining design life period, that is for 10 years. And after, after the 10 years, you will uh, rehabilitate your pavement and, and, and you will republish a new values. Okay, thank, thank you, Cyril. Then we have another top question. Will it be expected that whether seasonal PCR values will be published, um, they will have to be backed by seasonally different. So example, summer and winter field measurements. Yeah, it, it, it was already envisaged with the PCN and uh, this is um, still possible. And in some countries, this is even recommended. Uh, if I take the example of uh, runway, which are built on Mafros, for instance, we know that with the global warming, such runways uh, built on Mafros tend to, um, to, to, to lose uh, their uh, structural capacities uh, in uh, the summer period. So in that case, we can publish a seasonal uh, PCR. And the other case is uh, we uh, experienced uh, EV, uh, EV temperature last summer in Europe. Uh, in that case, the modulus of the asphalt layers uh, decreased significantly. In this case, it is also possible to uh, publish a seasonal uh, PCR uh, with a modification of the E modulus of uh, the, the bituminous layers. So this is not mandatory, but for pavement manage management, uh, this is something which can be very useful to protect uh, to protect your pavement over the time. Okay, and Cyril, I think it's um, this question is on the same topic. Will PCR take into account ground geological considerations? So, for example, an airport is on a swampy area and inducing low pavement strength in winter and high pavement strength in summertime? Yeah, this is the same, this is the same, the, roughly the same question. So this is also the same, uh, same answer. And I would say on the same topic, how are the measurement values affected by ground frost? Can you give an example, please? Affected by what? 
by Grand Frost. Grand Frost? Yes. Ah, the Frost. Uh, usually, the pavements uh, which are sensitive to frost are designed according to that, with like an extra thickness of the, the base layers. So, therefore, it is already um, accounted when you evaluate your pavement uh, with the frost protection, because this is already accounted in the pavement design. Okay. And we have another question. Maybe Miguel could complement this question. I don't know. Michael, if you are in oh, line yeah. the frost no. protection. Yeah, I uh, know you. Um, I agree with what you you, you explained. Yes, uh, there is a the, the frost protection is included uh, in the in the design. So um, no nothing uh, nothing to to add to what you said. Okay, and maybe then we can just go to another question. How is pavement failure defined? In real life, this is subjective and is not a black and white boundary that can be calculated. Yeah, sure. Um, so there is a theoretical approach and uh, there is a practical life. Uh, so usually the airports uh, are um, involved in the pavement survey, regular pavement survey, but the survey are, are done either uh, with non-destructive testing and also with, uh, with uh, the service index uh, procedures, but this is more related to the surface failure. And we can have some important information at the surface. For instance, when you observe um, a significant rooting at the surface, the observation of the root shape is very important. If you have an upheap hole on the, on the edge of the root, it means probably uh, that this is a surface defect. If you don't observe this upheap hole, uh, it, it probably means that uh, you have started the subgrade uh, failure. Okay, but for, 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 for the PCR, uh, this, is, uh, this is another story because this is an early computation of the, of, the, of the structural potential of your pavement. So this is directly linked with subgrade failure uh, criteria. Okay, okay. thanks. Why, why we identified the PCR based only on the subgrade failure criteria? This is because we have to protect the subgrade. If the subgrade fails, you have to rebuild entirely your runway or your pavement, generally speaking, and that will cost significantly more than a replacement of the surface course. And the surface course is also involved in the pavement design because this is very important uh, layers. But if the surface course is failed, uh, you can replace uh, or overload uh, your uh, your layers, and then to continue and to um, uh, to, to postpone uh, the the cigarette failure. So theoretically, a pavement uh, has an infinite uh, life if uh, it is well managed uh, according to that. Okay. Um, Senior, just let me know if we can take. Two more questions, or you prefer to go on with your uh, presentation? Well, I think I can continue with the example just to fix the idea, and uh, we will have probably some questions after the example. So, the example will also include the overload case. Okay, good. So, please then go ahead. Thank you. Okay, here we go. So, uh, the first example is for uh, a flexible pavement, which uh, was under design. Uh, it means that its CDF is uh, greater than one. So, under uh, design with regard to the analyzed traffic. So, it, 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 maybe this uh, pavement was well designed, but uh, after 10 years of operation, we observed that the reference traffic, which was used for the design, was not um, exactly uh, realized and uh, was significantly higher than uh, the first uh, forecast at the time of the pavement. So uh, this is an existing flexible taxiway uh, which was designed according to the US FAA design procedures. 
the subgrade modulus is uh, estimated to be uh, 59 megapascal, so therefore it means that the subgrade uh, category D, so the PCR, will be reported with a letter F and D for the two uh, first letter. There is no evidence of pavement distress which could be attributable to excessive tire pressure. So the uh, tire pressure limit code will be published with the category W. W means no tire pressure uh, limitation. And the damage model for the PCR evaluation is the same than the one used for the pavement design, that is the FA damage model for flexible uh, pavement. So this is this calculation was done with uh, with Fairfield. And uh, so it was also verified with my own um, software to compute the, the PCR. So this is a classical pavement, taxiway pavement uh, structures as per the uh, FA advisory circular uh, with the E modulus. Uh, you can see in uh, Fairfield. So you can observe compared to uh, E modulus. Um, we have in Europe, uh, these values are, are, are quite low, but this is because the FA software is um, conservative about these values uh, because the E modulus uh, correspond to a temperature of um, 29 degrees Celsius. So this is the reason why we have those values. And then you have the surface course composed of two layers of P209 crushed aggregate materials and your pavement subred with a modulus, as I said, of 59 megapascal and uh, an infinite uh, thickness. So then uh, this is the pavement inputs. The traffic input, so this is a simple traffic, uh, which is composed mainly by a single airplane and regional aircraft. So. Uh, they are described with their operating weights and their number of total passes over uh, the design periods. So in that case, I think it was, uh, it is not mentioned here, but it was, uh, I think it was a period of 20 years. So this is the number of movement for each aircraft over this uh, design uh, period. And since we used uh, the same damage parameters as for the pavement design, the across wonder uh, is the one uh, considered in the uh, Fairfield software. So this is 77 uh, centimeters for the standard deviation. So while usually uh, the devi deviation on uh, the uh, taxiways is less than uh, this one. So by using this software, uh, it, it will be a little bit um, less conservative because of the choice of the standard deviation. But if you have software which is able to adapt to adjust standard deviation, you can do it. And uh, this is a short movie of uh, the application of the, of the procedures I show. So try to follow the step. I will comment during. So you have the input data. The first step consists in identifying uh, the aircraft with the higher SCR. So in that case, this is a 747-900 extended range. Then you compute uh, the CDF of the entire mix. You identify the critical offsets. So in that case, as I said, the CDF is greater than one. The most contributing aircraft is a 737. Then you remove all aircraft and you keep only this one, you adjust its number of annual departure to arrive at the CDF of the entire mix, which is greater than one. Therefore, you adjust the aircraft weight no, to, ha, to, to, to get the CDF of one to make the aircraft compatible with, uh, with the um, analyzed pavement. So then it means that you have decreased the aircraft weight in that case, and you compute the uh, aircraft ACR at its reduced weight, which is 548 flexible D. And since this aircraft was also the max uh, ACR aircraft, the final PCR is obtained after only one iteration, and it is about 
548 flexible D and the other letters was W, um, W, T, T, because it's a technical evaluation. So uh, for the publication, so this is exact calculation, but for the publication PCR calculation, uh, you, you will round uh, the values to the nearest uh, entire number. So uh, the publication will be 550 flexible D, W, T. For the reports, okay. So uh, obviously the CDF uh, was greater than one, so it means that C737 ACR, which is about for flexible D pavements, uh, 563, it exceeds the reported PCR and would therefore be weight limited, which is consistent with uh, the fact that we have a CDF uh, greater than one. So just to um, to highlight the importance of uh, the, the design parameters, uh, if the, PC, the PCR would have been computed uh, with the French damage models, the French separate failure model, uh, the PCR would have been uh, 620 flexible DWT, and therefore um you will have an overestimated pcr with no limitation which would apply to the aircraft so it means that the aircraft uh, the limited aircraft 737 could be operated without any restriction uh, with the consequences of uh, the pavement uh, the pavement life reduction and possibly uh, with um, with a pavement uh, defect uh, either at the surface of uh, with a high number of annual departure also uh, uh, with um, uh, with um, damaging effect uh, on on the separate. So um, another example uh, with a pavement uh, CDF uh, lower than one. Uh, so it means that your pavement was strictly lower than one. It means it is uh, over design. Um, so this is a new constructed flexible taxiway which had been designed according to the French design procedures. The so subgrade modulus is estimated um, to uh, be uh, 80 megapascal, so it will be reported uh, with the category C. Um, there is no evidence in the last service index, for instance, of pavement distress, which could be attributable to excessive tire pressure, so it will be again reported with the tire pressure category W. And since the damage model for the PCR evaluation is the same than the one used for the pavement design, uh, that is the French damage model for flexible pavement. The design life uh, is about 20 years, and uh, the um, modulus of elasticity for the base surface and surface and and surface uh, layers. No, for the base course and the surface layers. Sorry. Uh, is uh, 15 C are uh, selected at a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. And since we have a taxiway, so the speed is about 30 km per hour, uh, which corresponds to a frequency of 3 Hertz. So this is uh, in this uh, pavement structures, uh, the adjusted effective E modulus. Uh, which take into account uh, the temperature and the aircraft speed on this uh, taxiway monitoring area. So this is uh, the, the the traffic uh, forecasted over us, uh, the pavement design life of uh, 20 years. So we have a combination of regional aircraft such as the ATR-72, some uh, short medium range aircraft, F-2021, 737, 800, 900, and two long range airplanes, 757 and the F-30, 200. So in that case, and uh, following the IQ recommendation as per the ADM part three, Regarding the aircraft wonder, we consider a normal uh, distribution of uh, on all uh, damage profiles with a standard deviation of 1.5 uh, meters uh, for uh, the taxiway. So uh, if the pavement was a runway, this is just to answer uh, the question I had earlier, uh, the only change uh, regarding the calculation 
would have been uh, a change in the standard deviation. So that will be, uh, in that case, uh, 0 0.75 meters. So uh, this is so this is an example. So I, I show um, a graphical uh, a graphical slide just to um, to explain what is it. It is, is it important to understand when you compute the, the CDF? So you have with a different color the CDF of each individual aircraft. All these individual aircraft, uh, when they are combined, each other produced uh, 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 a total CDF for the entire mix. And uh, on this curve, uh, the maximum values uh, is located at the critical offset, which is in that case at 3.5 meters from the uh, taxiway center line. Okay. So on the list, it is interesting to note that uh, the F330 uh, 300, which is the across with the higher. ACR has a very a small contribution to the max CDF. This is just because uh, this is the only long range aircraft which is combined with uh, a large number of uh, short medium range aircraft. And this is those aircraft which creates uh, the maximum CDF and also the location of the critical offset while the overall mainlanding air track of the F330 is significantly larger than the other aircraft. So therefore, its uh, individual uh, CDF is relatively high here, so if, you, if you can see my, uh, my moving arrow. Uh, but its contribution at the critical offset is, uh, is very low because of this position on uh, the pavement with regard to the pavement center line. And uh, so in that case, as I said, the uh, CDF of the total, total uh, traffic mix is 0 0.84. So it means that your pavement is over design and you, you, you once, um, once the, forecasted, the forecasted pavement will be realized after a period of time of 20 years, so that means that would mean that you will have Still, uh, a structural remaining potential of uh, of sixty percent in reality. So it means that your pavement can accept roughly sixteen percent of uh, more traffic. So uh, just to uh, to details all um, parameters, uh, just to, to 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 try to understand what. Uh, which parameters are a significant effect uh, on uh, the uh, pavement PCR. So the first thing to observe in this table, so this is issues issued from uh, my software, and you have all the step of the iteration uh, which has been calculated to arrive at uh, a PCR of uh, 690 uh, flexible C. Um, so here you have 0 0.26. Uh, uh, this is the max individual aircraft CDF. This is the highest with a Boeing 737-900. But the most, the first most uh, contributing aircraft in that case is the F320. Its contribution is about 21.1 percent. Okay. And the first iteration is therefore done for this aircraft, and uh, the first PCR is 440. The F3, uh, the critical offset, as I said, is 300, uh, is 3.5 meters, and the um, highest uh, ACR aircraft is uh, F330 300. Okay. And this ACR at its operating weight is about uh, 655. And this is normal because uh, we, we, we continue. This, this is, uh, this is um, the last iteration because this is the highest uh, ACR aircraft. 
And you can observe that its position uh, to um, the critical offset is uh, is is um, the largest one. So it is about uh, is um, far away from 2.25 meters from the critical offset. Okay, this is the reason why uh, its contribution to the max CDF is very marginal. This is because of its uh, millennial geometry. Okay. And uh, when we uh, perform this last iteration for this aircraft, we obtain a PCR of 690. So, in that case, the PCR is higher than the highest PCR aircraft, and this is absolutely normal because the CDF was lower than one. So, in that case, the PCR is higher than any aircraft PCR. Uh, composing uh, of the aircraft composing composing the mix. Okay, so um, this is maybe the most important slide of my presentation. This is just to understand the importance again of um, the parameters used uh, for the PCR determination. So the first line is uh, the PCR adjust uh, computed with. Um, by complying with uh, parameters which was used uh, for the pavement design. Okay, so on the second line, uh, I compute. I, I have computed the, the rendering effect, so the lateral dispersion effect, according to the method used in Fairfield, which is a method uh, which is called the past causal ratio. So this is the lat lateral component of the FA past causal ratio. In that case, when I change only these parameters, the CDF is greater than one. So you have no uh, an uh, under design pavement, while uh, before it was uh, over design. And then if you compute your uh, PCN according to this change, it, it is lowered. Okay. This is normal because, uh, because the CDF is greater than one. And uh, previously, the structural life was about 23, so almost 24, 24 years. So more than 20 years because uh, CDF was about 0, 84. And no, it's less than 20 years because the CDF is greater than one. So slightly higher, but higher. So you have four months less for the structural life. So then we uh, modify only the FA uh, subgrade failure model. So we replace the French um, subgrade uh, failure model by the FA, and the CDF is uh, almost divided by two, which um, lead to a uh, higher PCR value and a structural life, theoretical uh, structural life, which is significantly higher. And we combine uh, both parameters, so the wandering the way of calculating the wandering and uh, the Sigma failure model, uh, you arrived at a CDF of 1.17, uh, uh, a PCR of 650, and a reduced uh, structural life uh, compared to the initial pavement design life. So um, I spoke about the effective E modulus, uh, which can be uh, adjusted according to the temperature and also uh, the aircraft speed. So in um, in the case, in our case with the taxiway, uh, the pavement was designed with the E modulus at 15 temperature uh, degrees Celsius. If I modified the modulus according to the to an higher uh, temperature, uh, so let's say 30 degrees Celsius. And this is the only change uh, compared to uh, the initial calculation in green. Then the CDF uh, increased significantly to 2.41. Uh, Obviously, uh, with this higher CDF, your PCR values is uh, significantly decreased to uh, 500. And the structural, life, the structural life, theoretical structural life, is also uh, less than uh, half of the initial uh, pavement design life. And then if I modify the E modulus according to the speed, so it was a taxiway, so the initial speed for the calculation was 30 kilometers per hour. And now I um, 
I select a speed corresponding to uh, the runway, so 100 kilometers per hour, which corresponds to a frequency of 10 hertz. In that case, um, so in that case, the e-modulus is higher, so this is exactly the adverse effect uh, compared to an higher temperature, so the CDF is lower than the original one, and then the PCR is higher, and the expected um, structural life is also higher, and almost 30 years, or almost 10 years more than the initial calculation. And finally, when you combine uh, all parameters, so it means uh, you, you have a very, very bad consultant and all input parameters uh, was wrong. And in that case, uh, your final CDF is a 17 and then a PCR equal to 570. And the effect on uh, the structural life is 1.2 years instead of uh, the initial target of uh, 20 years. So, um, what is important to know uh, is the mechanism uh, of the PCR calculation with regard to the CDF. So, uh, on this slide, when you have a CDF greater than one, so 1.17, it means that when you run um, the, the PCR procedures, you will have uh, a step when you will have to adjust the aircraft weight to arrive at a CDF of one. And to do that, the only mean to do that is to decrease the aircraft weight. So therefore, you decrease uh, the aircraft ACR and then the PCR. So this is a normal mechanism uh, when you are to, to, to evaluate uh, a pavement with a CDF. Uh, lower than one or greater than one. So last example uh, before uh, the example uh, including the overload operation case. So this is um, in that case uh, a rigid pavement. So this is an apron which was designed uh, for uh, an airport in the US. So you can use in that case uh, Fairfield uh, to modelize your pavements. So the working stress in that case is 5.17 megapascal, and the calculated CDF according to the reference traffic is 1.05. So it means it is slightly under design, but very, very slightly. So the most contributing aircraft is the F-21. And uh, the aircraft uh, ACR at its operating weight is 605. And the resulting PCR, when you uh, perform the PCR procedures for this aircraft, is uh, 600 rigid BWT. So uh, the PCR is slightly lower than uh, the most demanding aircraft, than the F-21, which was 605. And it, it is again normal because your CDF was initially slightly uh, higher than uh, one. So it was 1.05. So therefore, it is normal to have uh, a PCR uh, which is lower than uh, at least one aircraft in the aircraft list. Okay. So this is a new, uh, in that case, it was a new uh, concrete uh, slab construction. So therefore, uh, there is no reason to have a tire pressure limitation. Uh, and we have at the end a PCR to be published of 600 RBWT. So next is about, now before uh, the overload operation, this is just a summary of some consequences if you have uh, PCR inaccuracies. So, uh, for cases, first, your uh, PCR is overestimated. Uh, it means that your CDF is underestimated. In that case, you will have a more traffic acceptance. So, either more aircraft weight or the volume of each aircraft composing the mix than what the pavement is able to accommodate. And you will have uh, in that case, premature pavement damage because we will accept more traffic. And then that could lead to an increase of maintenance and repair costs. 
uh, which will represent uh, a loss of uh, revenues for, for the airport, or, or at least an increase of uh, OPEX and even some CAPEX at some point. The second case uh, is a case of underestimated PCR, meaning overestimated, overestimated CDF. So in that case, it means that um, you could have aircraft weight or annual departure restriction or limitation that will represent um, that could represent a loss of airport uh, revenues um, throughout um, and um, pavement underuse and uh, loss of revenues uh, when uh, throughout the, the different um, airport uh, charges such as the, 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 the landing charges uh, which are based uh, in some cases on the aircraft weight. So if you refuse the aircraft or if you uh, impose uh, an aircraft uh, reduced weight, therefore you could lose uh, revenues because of that. And the third case uh, is obviously the um, ideal case. You have an optimized PCR. It means that the CDF is consistent with the initial pavement design parameters that will lead to a maximize uh, use of your pavement and then a reduced maintenance needs and costs and an increase of revenue. So the airport charges, as I said, so to the landing charges or the parking charges and maybe other charges. We are linked to the aircraft weight. And at the end, all of that contributes, uh, will contribute in the medium and long term to the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction for the well mastered pavement uh, life cycle from raw materials to, uh, to the pavement and life. So keep, keep this in mind. This is quite important also to have uh, uh, the. the the, the best um, pavement management system at airport uh, to reduce this uh, footprint carbon. So the overload operation, so to some time, this is good. Um, so running the overload uh, of pavements, uh, there is no real definition of the overload, but uh, the overload can result from either uh, aircraft loads larger than the design of the evaluation loads, or a substantially increased of application rates of existing traffic. So therefore, if you have an initial traffic with uh, aircraft defined by their operating weight and annual departure, if there is a significant change in the annual departure, it can be um, it can be uh, considered as an, an overload operations. So, except uh, a massive, a massive overloading, the pavement in their uh, structural behavior are not uh, subject to a particular limiting load above which they suddenly fail. So, uh, the sentence is correct for the flexible pavement, but not ready for the rigid pavement. But a rigid pavement. And failed, um, and uh, when you reach um, a weight a weight limits uh, of a given aircraft, and I would say because of the temperature gradient in the slab, uh, it can also uh, fail. So I speak about the rigid slab PCC slab uh, without any mechanical load, just because of uh, the temperature gradient, very excessive temperature gradient which produce a phenomenon of uh, warping or curling. So this is a curvature of the slabs. And in that case, we uh, already observed slabs uh, with longitudinal cracks because uh, the slab failed uh, according to its uh, self uh, weight because of the curvature shape. So the ICAO uh, provides uh, general pavement overload evaluation guidance for minor uh, overloading, and sometimes this is referred as the ICAO allowance. For larger overloads, uh, we can uh, assess uh, its effects uh, with a detailed technical analysis. This is what we will see with example, which is consistent with the PCR technical evaluation philosophy. And uh, the specific state practices for overloading operations is no longer available. So currently in the ADM, um, we had uh, I think three or four different uh, state practices for overload 
operation. So in that case, it is a new release of the ADM part three, so this 2022 um, uh, um, versions. Uh, there is no uh, state practices, and we will see why uh, we remove this part because this is no longer consistent with the philosophy of uh, the ACR this year. So, regarding the new um, IKO and uh, EASA uh, allowance for overload operations, so for the operation for which the magnitude of overload or the number of annual uh, departures do not justify a detailed analysis, uh, the following criteria uh, are suggested for flexible and for rigid pavements. Uh, we can accept occasional movement by aircraft with ACR not exceeding 10% above the reported PCR uh, because uh, with this magnitude of overload, uh, we uh, believe that uh, the pavement will not be adversely uh, affected. With the condition that the annual number of overload movements will not exceed approximately 5% of the total annual movement, excluding obviously the light aircraft, which are not accounted uh, in the reference traffic because there is there have no effect on the pavement uh, damage. Okay, so when you have to evaluate overload for aircraft with an ACR greater than the reported PCR uh, by a ratio less than 10%. You have first to uh, compute the number of allowable uh, overload operations, uh, which uh, is to be less than 5% of the total annual movements. Okay. So, uh, this uh, allowance uh, was previously, if you remember, 10% for the flexible pavement and 5% for the uh, for the rigid pavement. So we align both flexible and rigid pavements because now the ACR PCR methodology is based on the same uh, technology for both flexible and pavement. So this is the reason why we align to 10% the IKO uh, the IQ allowance. And the overload should not be permitted if uh, your pavement is exhibiting some sign of distresses. Also, during the period of uh, thaw following frost penetration, so we had question about that, huh? so we can have um, a seasonal publication of the PCR for such cases. And also, obviously, it is not recommended to accept overload operation when your pavement is modified because of the environmental conditions. So, should it be the frost penetration, but also um, the um, the high uh, temperature period during the summer as we uh, experience this summer. And also, uh, the overload should not be permitted when the strength of the pavement uh, can be uh, weakened by, uh, by water penetration. So, the pavement condition should be uh, regularly monitored when the overload operations are granted by the airport. And uh, remember also that excessive overloads may significantly reduce the pavement structural life. So this is something which has, uh, which should be uh, thought uh, when an airport grants uh, an overload uh, operation. So the kind of trade-off of uh, the revenues, which is uh, due by the airline's movement and uh, the, 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 what will cost also to the airport if the uh, overload operations, which has been granted, uh, has not been, um, I would say, uh, correctly uh, evaluated or determined. So, um, in the case of the overloads are in excess of 10%, uh, in that case, uh, we will see that it is needed to uh, perform uh, a technical uh, technical evaluation. And for this technical evaluation, the inputs required are exactly the same than the one which are used for the PCR evaluation. That is the pavement structures, the aircraft traffic, uh, aircraft traffic including obviously the overload uh, operations. And the damage model, uh, which, uh, we, we, which uh, has to be consistent with the PCR calculation and the pavement design. 
So the ultimate decision again, as it was the case for the ACN PCN to grant overload operations belongs to the airport operators and it, uh, it depends uh, of the impact of such operations of pavement life and its pavement management policy. So this is what I said just before, a cost benefit analysis between the loss of, the loss of pavement life versus additional revenues can also support such a decision making process. So this is the first example of uh, overload operations. Um, we have a flexible pavement roadway which has been designed uh, with the French uh, design procedures to accommodate a pure single L medium range across traffic over a period of 10 years. So you have the traffic data. So this is an example, this is a realistic, this is not a realistic traffic we have only in that case for aircraft. But anyway, uh, each aircraft is assigned with a number of annual departure over this period of 10 years. You have the operating weight and the uh, aircraft uh, PCRs at their operating weight. So in that case, the F-21 aircraft is the uh, most, uh, is the high, highest uh, ACR aircraft. The design pavement structures uh, as a maximum CDF of 0.95 at the critical offset, and the PCR, uh, the computed PCR, uh, which is published uh, based on this uh, pavement data and uh, traffic data, is about 560 flexible CWT. So I did not uh, mention the pavement data because it was exactly the same data that I used for, uh, I think it was the second example. So it is proposed on uh, these pavement structures to uh, operate one daily departure of a long haul destination with a fully loaded FWE 21 Neo long range. So the ACR of this aircraft uh, at its maximum ramp weight is about 580 flexible fee, and therefore it exceeds the reported PCR. And, uh, but the ACR exceeds the PCR by less than 10%, and the number of overload, overload movement, which is one per day, uh, is not exceeding 5% of the total movement, which, which was an average of 25 movement per day. So in that case, uh, the overload operation can be granted by the airport as per the IKO and IASA allowance. Okay, there is no need to perform a technical analysis. You are in the IKO allowance of 10% allowance. So, no next example. So, in this example, we have an airline. Uh, we ask a pavement concession to introduce uh, on the same pavement, obviously, one daily departure of an F330-900 uh, NEO. So the uh, ACR of this aircraft at its maximum ramp weight is 710 flexible C and therefore exceeds the PCR by more than 25%. So it is, seems frankly higher than the 10% IQ and he has allowance. And the technical analysis shows that the actual impact is limited to an increase of pavement damage, so the pavement dam uh, CDF, by 5%. So if we observe what, uh, when we introduce this aircraft, so this is the initial traffic with the CDF of 0 0.95, we add the aircraft. And the effect of the addition of the new additional aircraft and the CDF is a CDF of 0 0.99, that is uh, an increase of uh, almost 5% compared to the initial uh, CDF of the initial uh, aircraft mix. So in that case, we can see that the effect of the overload aircraft is very marginal uh, because of uh, the contribution of the overload aircraft and its uh, main landing gear characteristic. Uh, geometries, which is uh, far from uh, the critical offset, which lead to uh, an, an significant uh, effect on the max CDF. 
And uh, on top of that, when we add this overload aircraft, uh, the new uh, CDF is 0.99, so it is uh, lower than one. So this aircraft uh, with a requested uh, daily departure is fully compatible with, uh, with the pavement. So uh, fully, comp fully uh, compatible with the pavement structures, but obviously uh, it is needed to um, to check also uh, the other uh, taxiway features like uh, a taxiway width, which which would also comply with uh, with this with this aircraft. So based on uh, it, in, uh, a cost benefit analysis, the airport may in that case allow these uh, overload operations. So. Um, in summary, uh, what will be the benefits of uh, the new uh, ACR PCR, PCR system? So, not only uh, for the airport, but also for the airlines. Um, so, uh, it should be first recognized that the ACR PCR system uh, overcome uh, the deficiencies and the drawbacks of the ACN PCN system and will allow uh, consistency and alignment between the pavement design and the pavement rating system. So it was also uh, one of the reasons why the IKO uh, tasked its, um, its pavement subgroup to, um, to define a new rating system, uh, because most of the IKO member states uh, design their uh, pavement uh, with a rational method, so he, in that case, he, he, it was really inconsistent uh, to evaluate the pavement with the early design method, while the pavement was not designed with a rational method. So, the new system will um, enable an, uh, an optimized usage uh, in terms of allowable aircraft weight and frequency of the existing and future pavement without excessive conservatism compared to the ACN PCN system except if the design parameters used for the PCR uh, procedures are not adequately determined and evaluated. For aircraft operators, it should lead to fewer, fewer uh, pavement induced waste restriction, but may exist a local uh, exception, uh, which can be uh, still possible, obviously. And for uh, airport operators, it will provide a consistent damage-based approach with an optimized use of the pavement. Uh, the possibility to assess the impact of overload operation, to assess and to quantify the impact of overload operations. Uh, and that will improve the pavement life prediction because uh, thanks to the rational uh, method, um, this is um, a protocol which allows for the CDF calculation um, to, um, to improve the predictivity of the pavement damage and to uh, transition from, I would say, um, a curative approach on pavement to a predictive approach. And last, for the aircraft manufacturer, it will also them to allow them to optimize the landing gear geometry, so both the leg geometry itself, but also the overall main landing gear geometry, so the space between uh, between the different gears, uh, the type of gears, two wheels, four wheels, bogey, six wheels, bogey, and so on, uh, for their uh, product, uh, future products. So that will be also um, design parameters for the manufacturer when we will develop uh, new uh, aircraft models. So the reference document Simona spoke about earlier this morning. So the first document obviously is the Annex 14 with uh, the inclusion of the Amendment 15. Uh, but the Annex 14, I would say, is a law. So we have only the method overviews, the definition, and the PCR reporting format, but there is no details about the ACR PCR but these details can be found in the Airline Design Manual. So this is the doc 9157, this is the part three, and the, uh, alors, uh, the third edition. So I made a, a typo, it's not a third ND, but a third edition, uh, which has been, uh, so this edition was uh, completed in uh, November 2020 in reality, but that has been uh, published only in July this year, because usually IKO publish uh, its manuals and annexes 
with the full packages of the six different IKO official languages. And in that case, because of the COVID-19, uh, they took some delays. So that's the reason why for the time being, we have only the English version. And this is, um, this is why uh, this version is called uh, the advanced uh, version, but the final version will be exactly the same in English and uh, the ADM is available in the uh, IQ web store uh, for the advanced uh, publication. And according to the last message I had from the uh, IQ Secretariat, the five other official languages should be available uh, before the end of this year. So uh, this is about the, um, so we have the English version available and we will have the Spanish one, French, uh, Chinese, Russian, Arabian, and I forget probably one. No, I think uh, we have six official languages. And this is the end of my presentation. Celia, thank you very much also for, for this part. Very interesting. Um, while you were presenting, I launched some polls and I was asking if the participants had found the information useful and most of them said yes, so actually the majority. However, some of them also said that they need more details. And when we speak about more details, they were referring to how to calculate the PCR. But I think this was already kind of predicted that that would be that would be the main one. Uh, and also uh, more details on the regulatory transposition. So they, these were the, the main ones. Um, so, yeah, we, we are closing to one o'clock. Um, one o'clock local here in Cologne. Um, maybe, Cyril, if you agree until one, could we take some additional questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. I, I, I will. I will take my lunch later. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, one question sounds like this: What will be the uh, effect on existing pavements from transitioning? ACN PCN to ACR PCR. Can we allow some extra load by aircraft to operate, or load restriction will be imposed under the new regime? Good question. Uh, for the transition, you will have to evaluate your pavements. Your pavements was probably over design because it was based on the semi empirical methodology, so which is called the early methods. Uh, by essence of uh, the empirism, uh, it was probably uh, over design. So, therefore, when you will evaluate your actual existing pavement with a new methodology to compute the CDF, uh, it is likely you, you will have uh, a more structural potential. On your pavement, and therefore less aircraft weight restriction. Okay, thank you. This is a, this is a general, general case, obviously in some cases, uh, because your pavement was uh, is not in a good state uh, because the design was not correct, and for many other reasons, when you will evaluate again your pavements uh, for PCR calculation. Uh, you could have uh, bad surprises. But the gen general case is that the early design method was over conservative, and therefore, using the new methodology, which are more predictive and more accurate, uh, your pavement should be less restrictive in terms of maximum aircraft allowable takeoff weight. Okay, so I'll, I will go to the next question. Um, it seems that the ACR PCR benefits are delivered to the aircraft operators, and the cost of new testing and engineering is sitting entirely with the airport operators. Small airports with limited revenues and expertise will find this very hard to do. How uh, do we help them? Yeah, sure, yeah. 
Again, I tw tw it was a case also for the uh, for the ACNPCN, so I forget to specify that the ACRPCR is intended to apply to all airports receiving aircraft with a max takeoff weight greater than 5.7 tons. Um, anyway, uh, for small airports, um, I, I would say that I understand the concerns. Uh, I would recommend to for, for no, November 2024 uh, to publish the PCR uh, based on the aircraft experience, and then to update the PCR uh, with a technical evaluation when the pavements are gradually um, refurbished or uh, rehabilitated. And then the next question. Is the new method strongly related to the number of movements per type of aircraft? Would the airport have to redo the study every time there's a change in the fleet mix or a deviation from the traffic forecast? No, not every time. Uh, only when you have a significant change. I give you a positive example, uh, in that way, a positive example. When we had uh, the, the, the COVID-19, we have a significant change of the traffic. Okay, it means that many of the airports lost 50 percent of the traffic to time. Uh, I made some calculation uh, with the COVID-19 impact on the pavement CDF, and it was about between 10 percent and 15 percent less because at that time there is not aircraft traffic in the sky. So in that case, it would have been made sense to reevaluate the pavement uh, according to that. Okay, if you have a new, if you have a new aircraft model with a significant higher um, aircraft takeoff weight compared to the reference traffic, if the number of annual departure of this aircraft is marginal compared to the rest of the traffic, it will not be necessary to reevaluate uh, the pavement. But what is important when the airport will perform the PCR calculation is to document the PCR dossier uh, to be able. Uh, to uh, compare, uh, to, 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 and to be able to reassess the PCR in case of a significant change and to evaluate if they have really a significant change or if, or is, if it is uh, not significant. Because, for instance, uh, when we have the example we, with the F330 uh, mixed with, uh, with a smaller airplane, uh, it, 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 its impact on the CDF was marginal because of the geometry of the landing gear. So, if they have this case, for instance, so this is a significant change because of the aircraft weight, but in terms of CDF impact, it is marginal. In that case, it is not necessary to reevaluate the PCR. Okay. Thank you. And the next question, will there be any specific and dedicated workshops led by national agencies with aerodromes uh, certification or compliance monitoring managers to prepare this critical transition in time. Here, maybe I can give some input. I know some of the NAAs have already started uh, providing such such workshops, um, but I think this is also a good question for us and at EASA to take it on board and to further discuss it in the. Uh, advisory bodies, the aerodromes uh, advisory bodies. Yeah, uh, so that will be one of the items I will discuss uh, in two weeks now with the APEC members. Um, so we have prepared um, a material for ACR PCR trainings. So this material is training designed for um, the training which would last between one and two days with all details but which is customized for people who will be in charge of calculating, uh, calculating the, the PCR. Uh, anyway, it is very uh, complex to organize such uh, trainings. Uh, it is not adapted uh, with a webinar because this is more than one day. This is very technical. And uh, I, I think after we have the awareness session, which is quite uh, similar to, to the one we, we had this morning, so I will discuss with the IKO, but the idea is to have the awareness session for in all IKO regional offices and 
uh, the detailed screenings uh, which will well, which will be done on request. Okay, thank you. I think we don't have time to take any other questions because the, I'm, I'm just looking at them and they are quite technical. So uh, maybe we can look afterwards, Cyril, at, uh, at these questions. Um, what I can say is thank you very much to all participants and many thanks to also to Cyril and to Mikhail for dedicating their time and supporting us in, in this webinar. And um, yeah, I, I hope you found it very useful. It, it's the first one I was mentioning in the beginning that it's actually the first one at international level of, of this kind on this topic. So thanks for taking your time to, to join us and uh, I wish you all a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simona. Bye-bye.